so much. That's so sweet. Thank you very much. I'm so touched by that beautiful introduction and by your kind welcome here. Uh, it's a great honor to be back in Victoria, a place I fell in love with 39 years ago. I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, but thank you so much for having me as part of this series. It's really impressive what you're doing here to be on the campus that uh, this is the heaviest thing I've lifted with my left hand in five weeks. Um, both of these uh, journals uh, is really impressive. You should be very proud. And uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, I guess you only have to come an hour early to get a seat if you're in Victoria, not in San Antonio. Um, it's really kind of you to be this generous to come hear me. Uh, 39 years ago, I came to Victoria to work at the high school with students. Is there anyone here by any chance whom I met in those days? I came maybe four years in a row. Many of you were not born there then, 39 years ago, I realized, but some of you might have been you know, seniors, at least. Uh, but I fell in love with this community, all the wonderful teachers here. Uh, the road between San Antonio and Victoria remains one of my favorite Texas drives, and uh, just the spirit of, of this place. So it's really uh, very touching to be invited back. Thank you so much. Thanks to my old friends, uh, Dagoberto Gilb and Beverly Lowry also for coming in uh, today. It's really great to see them and um, my close friend Claudia who drove me from San Antonio. Um, uh, the past uh, five weeks recovering from a broken wrist, I had to have surgery in Honolulu for Christmas. Um, was, uh, it's been a unique uh, period and I'm very happy to be able to hold a book with two hands just as of yesterday. Um, so uh, forgive me for my what might appear to be a little disorganization up here. I am known for taking more stuff than I use uh, to all of my events, but I did bring two poems by other people, which I was going to read to open this reading. And unfortunately, those are the two I can't find. Maybe they're in our car. Um, one was a great poem by Jane Hirschfield called Against Uncertainty. And I think um, it's a poem that, uh, that we all could read uh, once a day and, and gain something from. Every time I read it, I, I hear something new in it. It reminds me why I fell in love with poetry as a child. So Against Uncertainty by Jane Hirschfield, I recommend that poem. And another was a poem written when the writer was four, a boy named Rainier, Rainer, he's named for Rainier Maria Rilke, uh, Rainer Pasca. Some of you may have seen him on um, Ellen show. He's a presidential expert uh, during the past presidential campaign, he and his littler brother Atticus were on uh, four times on Ellen's show talking about presidents in the United States. They're experts. And right now I think they're like five and three. Um, anyway, I have a poem he wrote when he was four. I know his father, who's a poet, teacher. Um, and in that poem, he talks about uh, the greatest pleasure. It's called Rainer's Mind. The greatest pleasure is being alone with your own mind sometimes. And uh, just listening to the birds with your mind and not feeling you have to say anything about it. Just being able to absorb the birds. And um, it reminds me of why I fell in love with, with poems as a child also. So those were two that unfortunately are here somewhere. Now, I've been carrying this magazine, Wisace, around the magazine of Latino literature since, since I um, first saw it. It's really uh, a profoundly beautiful magazine, something to be proud of. And, and I'm going to read a poem uh, that I wish I hadn't written uh, last year, but um, news of war in far places often stirs us to all kinds of um, troubled thoughts. Um, why are we so lucky not to be there? Uh, what is it like for the people who are there? How can this be happening? Um, since every religious tradition that I know of says, thou shalt not kill, where do people go wrong? Um, so I will read this poem. And by the way, I also wanted to thank Carolina of The Advocate for the nice story she wrote. And uh, Luis, wasn't that his name for the... the Robert who did the, the picture? I, I did think I should get some tattoos um, before coming down here after Carolina sent me that. I was really impressed with the tattoos. Oh, my grandmother had tattoos like that. Um, but I don't yet. A few questions for Bashar Assad in 2012. And this was in this journal from here. We need to know about your shoes, whether they retain ties of a traditional kind or you now prefer slip-ons. Do they sit 
buffed leather beside your wardrobe at night? Did you glance out the window today or place your hand on the head of your child within the last 24 hours? Can you recall exactly what that child said to you or asked? If you made any kind of promise, was it less a conversation than a comfort, something a parent expects at the end of a day as the family circles and dines, tucks in, abides? Was today's breakfast predetermined, a usual menu, or food you requested on the spot? Anything in that meal to be peeled, perhaps? And who peeled it? Are there any burned out bulbs in any lamps? Once in Homs, some of us purchased pistachios weighed in an old balance scale coned into brown paper bag with the top folded over. The grinning vendor poured in extra, touched his forehead. Those nuts tasted smoky for 200 miles. Did you ever purchase anything in Hums and like the person who sold it to you? Are you sleeping enough? Can you remember the time before you were bigger than a man? Have those days dissolved? Did you taste the water at Ma'alula from the miracle spring in a cave, the water said to bring faithful people whatever they wish for? Is it still flowing? Do you know? Um, I keep reading about uh, Aleppo, which really was one of the world's most beautiful cities, and um, thinking how it's not described that way. These days, it's described as a heartbreaking site where, you know, people are murdered in uh, large numbers. And um, our own news out of northern Mexico this past week, 20 musicians in a well. Um, I think that violence is definitely something that we have to uh, face, whether or not we, how much we despise it, um, how lucky we are to have stayed at arm's length from it in our own lives. Uh, whether or not we have people in those countries where these things are happening. Um, a world which can, can have so much violence in it seems to me a world which also needs more stories and poetry in it. Um, it always seemed to me as a child that, that poetry uh, gave us a place to honor one another's details. Um, when I was a child, even though it was a long time ago, Emily Dickinson was no longer living, and. I was in love with the world she had lived in simply through her very short poems and that sense that we could be given worlds through four lines, eight lines, and participate in one another's experience was what made me fall in love with the slow, careful, shaped language of poetry. So here are a couple from 19 Varieties of Gazelle. Um, when, when I was a child and my father was a recent immigrant refugee, he didn't know many popular songs in English, and the few that he did know were not our favorites. Um, <laughs> what kind of fool am I? He sang with abandon, combing his black, black hair. Each morning in the shower, first in Arabic, rivery ripples of song carrying him back to his first beloved land, then in English, where his repertoire was short. No kind at all, we'd shout, throwing ourselves into the brisk arc of his cologne for a morning kiss. But he gave us freedom to be fools if we needed to, which we certainly would later, which we all do now and then. Perhaps a father's greatest gift, that blessing. Um, sometimes people ask me about identity and, you know, where did you really start um, facing your identity as an Arab American and so forth? And I think moving to a Mexican American city at the age of, of 16 um, had a lot to do with that because I felt, I felt uh, that people's discussions about culture and, you know, mixed heritage, they made sense to me, um, whether or not I matched 
uh, those discussions exactly or not. And I loved living in San Antonio and graduating both from high school and college there, a city where you could feel uh, a proud of, of um, indigenous culture and feel that you could um, be accepted even if you didn't, didn't match everyone around you. And so this goes back to, in, in my childhood, um, our humble living rooms, we had one fancy pillow. And you know how your parents clean up when guests are coming or try to put away all the newspapers or make it nice. My mother always made sure to put this one pillow in the spot where she would invite the guests to sit. So um, that pillow had certain um, cachet. It was our one luxury item. I knew that it had been made from the remnants of a vest she sewed for my brother. But other people thought it looked fancy. So red brocade. The Arabs used to say, when a stranger appears at your door, feed him for three days before asking who he is, where he's come from, where he's headed. That way, he'll have strength enough to answer. Or by then, you'll be such good friends, you don't care. Let's go back to that. Rice, pine nuts. Here, take the red brocade pillow. My child, will serve water to your horse. No, I was not busy when you came. I was not preparing to be busy. That's the armor everyone put on to pretend they had a purpose in the world. I refuse to be claimed. Your plate is waiting. We will snip fresh mint into your tea. Um, when I was growing up, the, world, the word busy was not as popular in, in our American lives as it became later. And uh, some, sometimes people don't realize that uh, this is a stereotype of our country now. Uh, I try to travel in other countries once or twice a year to work with students elsewhere. And people always ask me, students always bring up, why are Americans so busy? And I say, well, where did you hear this? And they will always say, from an American. And just thinking about it, um, I found that a word that I objected to um, many years ago, that it didn't seem to help me in my life to think of life as being busy. If you wake up every morning and think about how busy you are, it will not really give you fuel to get more things done. You'll just feel worse while you're doing them. So I urge you to identify words that don't serve you um, and cast them aside. And it's an interesting thing to write about, too, You know, words that do not belong in your lexicon, words you prefer not to own. Even if it's a word that someone else has applied to you or a way you've been described or something your parents said to you. Um, my husband was described in his Corpus Christi Elementary School uh, once by a nun as the non-speller of my classroom. And he told me later he was about 40 before he could cast that aside. He liked spelling. He just had a hard time with it. So um, after my father died five years ago, uh, I was fascinated to go through his very, very minimalist belongings. My father, having been a refugee as a young man, did not keep many things. He didn't own fancy things. He didn't have any you know, expensive cufflinks or watches or anything. But I found a scrapbook in his closet that fascinated me because it did seem to me that since he was a journalist and I was a writer, he would have shown me this scrapbook sometime in my whole life, and he had not. Most of the things in the scrapbook were letters to editors of American newspapers that he had written back in the early 1950s when he first came to this country. They were great letters. Um, they could be sent to any newspaper today and I think still be pretty true. Um, but also I found letters from people whom he had obviously written to first, answering some of his correspondence. So this was one, and I just couldn't believe he never showed it to me. It's called Knowing. On April 16, 1953, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a letter to my father answering one of his own. No, she said, I do not think Arab refugees should be permitted excuse me, to return to their homes in Israel. There are few homes to return to. I imagine his face, perfect burn of indignation. He would carry his lost home into the next millennium and never enter it again, though it remains intact till now. 
She numbered her answers. Two, I do not know if it is advisable to internationalize Jerusalem. She had worked for black youth, the unemployed. She helped to found the United Nations. She stood up for Marian Anderson when they wouldn't let her sing. My dad, at 25, trying to support a wife and baby in a tired American city, wanted to sing. Till now, the same questions dangle in air. Three, I do not know if there should be an Arab Palestine as an independent state side by side with Israel. Very sincerely yours. She signed the letter with a shaky hand from her perch at Val Kill Cottage, Hyde Park, Dutchess County, New York. Such a nice address, unencumbered by numbers. Eleanor did not know. She was honest about not knowing. She would die at 78 from bone marrow tuberculosis. He would die at 80, still frustrated, still writing letters. We live on puzzles of power unraveling around us, building new walls, proclaiming, protesting. One phrase worth clinging to, side by side. My mother says he wrote her often. This was not her only reply. So um, last year I was in Geneva, Switzerland, and um, I got to go to the United Nations building there for a tour, and they have this huge bust of Eleanor Roosevelt. And I just stood in front of it for a long time, stared at her face, and thought about that. And I was very touched that she would take the time to answer my father. Well, um, you know, dear Abby just died, right, like a few weeks ago. And um, I, I grew up reading advice columns and taking them pretty seriously. I would always cut out the answers in case I would have those problems later <laughs> and paste them, paste them in my journal. I'm doing all kinds of bad things up here with microphones. Um, I would paste them in my journals in case I would have those problems later. And um, so this actually starts, this poem starts with a real letter uh, to, to Dear Abby column, maybe four or five years ago, maybe read this letter. It was weird. Alive. And uh, I was thinking how fanning through journals and reading lots of advice columns, um, you, you, and I know now there are a lot of online advice columns. There are all kinds of people giving advice everywhere. I love it in, in schools, high schools I visit, the high school students who give advice to each other. They're great columns. But, um, but when, you, when you start thinking in terms of advice columns, well, you could just keep asking advice of everything, right? I mean, everything you encounter. So this is called Alive. Dear Abby, said someone from Oregon, I am having trouble with my boyfriend's attachment to an ancient gallon of milk, still full in his refrigerator. I told him it's me or the milk. Is this unreasonable? Dear Carolyn, she writes in the San Antonio Express News. My brother won't speak to me because 50 years ago, I whispered a monkey would kidnap him in the night to take him back to his true family. <laughs> but he should have known it was a joke when it didn't happen, don't you think? <laughs> Dear Board of Education, no one will ever remember a test. Repeat, stories, poems, projects, experiments, mischief, yes, but never a test. Dear dog behind the fence, you really need to calm down now. <laughs> you have been barking every time I walk to the compost for two years, and I have not robbed your house. <laughs> Relax. When I asked the man on the other side if you bother him too, he smiled and said, no, he makes me feel less alone. Should I be more worried about the dog or the man? <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Um, this poem was written after being with, um, I don't know if any of you know Victor Emmanuel of Austin. He's one of the great bird watchers of the world. He runs Emmanuel Nature Tours. And, um, 
about a year or two ago, I had occasion to go with him and some other serious bird watchers to this place near New Braunfels called Warbler Woods. Has anyone ever been there? It's kind of an interesting bird watching site because they give you a lawn chair and you sit down and the birds come to you. So it sounds like it would be a lot easier than just you know kind of going out into the wild. And it was. I mean, Victor brought a bowl of guacamole. We were sitting there for hours. But um, not being quite as serious as the rest of this group, um, after about four or five hours, my thoughts were drifting. So this is called lying while birding. <laughs> yes, yes, I see it. <laughs> so they won't keep telling you where it is. <laughs> And um, my father's birthday was May 5th, and he loved the Cinco de Mayo parades on his birthday. He always said they were for him. And, um, so if this is your birthday and you are dead, do we stay silent as the sheet you died under? No. You always talked. Here's a thick white candle whispering. Pour birdseed into feeders. Speak up. Tell me where they go, my friend said, in the same pain. I touched her shoulder. Here, right here. You're closer than you ever were. Takes a while to know that. Every scrap of DNA, he's listening. There's a way not to be broken that takes brokenness to find it. I, I wanted to thank you all here in your graphic arts for mimicking um, for my lovely poster here the copy of this book, Transfer. These were poems I wrote to my father or about my father in some way, except not all of them, like the Dear Abby one really doesn't have him in it, although he loved advice columns too. Um, after his death, and that's a Southwest Airlines baggage tag, and I did follow the advice of a, a poet I've loved for many years, Alastair Reed of Scotland, who said um, in a poem about his own father dying many years ago, he said at the end of his poem, uh, now begins the conversation going on and on and on. And um, I did find that continuing to speak to uh, the loved one who has died um, was the most healing thing that, that I was able to do. And um, so I, I would just pass that on for what it's worth, because I think sometimes we just need strategies and, and ways to you know, keep living and keep remembering. And, and notebooks are very good places to put, put uh, those conversations down in. Um, Another thing I'd like to recommend, and this seems really primitive, but at least I didn't lose this paper between Victoria, I mean San Antonio and Victoria, is sometimes I think it's good to write on really different sizes of paper. And uh, sometimes when I have students, I'll, I'll urge them, that everything that, that I'm asking them to write that week, they have to write only on post-it notes. Um, but I think that's harder than doing this, writing on large paper. And so sometimes I like to get those cheap sheets at an art supply store or university campus bookstore um, of just big paper and like on this this page I ended up having the beginnings this was an old like the beginnings of three different poems this thing I didn't use I don't think but um, something happens when you write on a different size of paper and I just would urge you all um, even though as we get older we often give up our primitive tactics that we had as children for you know trying things out um, something as simple as um, writing with colored pencils, if you haven't done that for years, or writing on larger paper or smaller paper can really help you. So in the spirit of daily writing, I'll like to read you the thing I'm working on that I just started yesterday, although it happened a couple of days after I broke my wrist in Honolulu. I read a newspaper story about an incredible local person. Um, Honolulu is a city that still has many like old businesses, family owned, as it, it appears Victoria does too. And for a long time I've been a big advocate of, you know, we, if we don't support them, we won't have them. So um, I wrote a whole novel for teens on that topic called Going, Going. It's my least loved book. Um, but, uh, but this was for someone I ended up going to meet. It's called Barbershop. And this is my, um, as you can see, I just scribbled it down. Lots of lines are already crossed out, but it's still in the first draft stage. Barbershop. Mary, that's for Mary Endo, in honor of Mary Endo. Mary of Kalihi is closing down. Today, her last, after 62 years of trimming hair, 
soaping necks in the same spot, Mary with the candy striped awning, who is 91, who loves listening, nothing taboo, politics, romance, Mary of the steady hand, Mary you could count on, 62 years, hardly a drop in the bucket. Oh, sorry. 62 years, hardly a drop in the shaving mug. Bring her a thank you, bigger than Honolulu. Bring her a hug, though you never met her before. Your whole life, she was in there. Something else you could have counted on, had you known. Now banished by a greedy landlord. She's taking it in stride. When you swing the door, she's cutting a guy's hair on her last day just like any, wearing a pink apron. When you hand over the newspaper feature and single red rose, she looks quizzical. He says, see Mary, she don't even know you and she loves you too. Every chair full, they're all lined up. People waiting for a last clip, a last listen. What is the size of this farewell? Mary. Mary, you have such a strong grip. Well, of course, a strong grip at that moment when I had lost mine um, stood out to me. But um, I was haunted by the story which really sang her praises and mentioned her customers saying, you know, in my whole life, she was the one person I could talk to uh, where I didn't have to censor anything. You know, my wife left me. I could go to Mary and tell her the whole story. Um, I was upset about politics. I could go to Mary, and she would listen and talk back. And I thought, wow, how can this landlord be doing it? Just how can he do it? How are they letting him do it? That's what I wanted to know. Um, so one of the things my uh, rehab therapist keeps talking about is fists. And I can't make one with this hand anymore. Uh, but this is a very old poem of mine that's haunting me. She doesn't know I wrote a poem called Making a Fist years ago after uh, my first trip through Texas as a child. So this is, if any of you have ever had a, an occasion when making a fist became, you know, a mark of something. And students have asked me, was that meant to be political? Like this kind of fist? And I say, well, maybe if it is to you. That's fine. For the first time, on the road north of Tampico, I felt the life sliding out of me. Drum in the desert, harder and harder to hear. I was seven. I lay in the car watching palm trees swirl a sickening pattern past the glass. My stomach was a melon split wide inside my skin. How do you know if you're going to die? I begged my mother. We had been traveling for days. With strange confidence, she answered, when you can no longer make a fist. Years later, I smile to think of that journey. The borders we must cross separately, stamped with our unanswerable woes. I, who did not die, who am still living, still lying in the back seat behind all my questions, clenching and opening one small hand. And um, I, uh, I mentioned to Carolina that I would read the beginning of a story that's from uh, my most recent book, which was my first book of short stories. Uh, the title of it is, There Is No Long Distance Now. And I'm just going to read the very, very beginning of the story. Um, it's one of the three, three stories in this book that's presented as fiction that was nonfiction. So one of the three that really happened. Um, I wrote it down within the hour after it happened. Um, I'm Callie in the story, but it doesn't really say that. And uh, I'll just read the very beginning. It's called, Are We Friends? And, um, you know, sometimes you think about racism and stereotyping, and um, it's always struck me that things just pop up when you least expect them. You know, it's not like you find these things in a predictable place necessarily at all. Are we friends? Callie stepped into a yellow taxi at the Chicago airport and gave the address of the hotel where she and her teacher would be convening for the Poetry Out Loud National Finals. Her teacher had been concerned when they couldn't travel together, but Callie wasn't worried at all. She knew how to get places. 
She was using her dad's frequent flyer miles and took a different airline. All the way, she'd been saying her three memorized poems inside her head. Where are you coming from? The driver greeted her. There was snow beside the road. Corpus Christi. <laughs> Turned out he had once lived in the same Texas coastal town where Callie lived now. She said, that's crazy. So do you get back down to Texas? I do, he paused. But the whole coast is ruined. They were stopped at a light. Callie thought he might be referring to smokestacks, spewing residue, stretching suburbs, the shrinking shrimp population. He said, they've built three mosques. What? And they work in all the gas stations and quick shops, too. She'd been in his car less than five minutes. His meaning hit her, that unattended they. He was driving a little too fast. You mean Arabs, Muslims? She could see his pale eyes in the rearview mirror staring at her. He nodded. She gulped and paused. Well, my dad is an Arab from a Muslim family, and he's adorable. Not very religious in any way, but super sweet. You would like him. The driver swerved, pulled to the side of the road, took his foot off the pedal. Callie thought he might be throwing her out but he turned his head around. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Are you mad at me? It was strange. A man passed on the sidewalk with a poodle and a pink sweater on a leash. Callie said, I'm not mad. I guess I'm just sad, though. She didn't know what to say. The driver accelerated slowly again, pulling back into traffic. She said, haven't you ever known any nice Arabs? He said, you are really mad, aren't you? <laughs> I'm sorry. I talk too much. Callie said, haven't you? She was thinking about prejudice, how it might begin so simply. They come from elsewhere. They don't look the way I do. Why did people want to match? And here they were in the great multicultural city of the first African-American but also half-white US president in history. One of his cities. Callie slumped in the seat. The driver said, my girls are in Iraq. What? They're nurses. They don't see much action. Frankly, they're in it for the money. And they met some nice Arabs. They said so. Callie said, wow, were they wounded? My daughters? No, the Arabs. You said your daughters are nurses. Yes, wounded. Well, it goes on. Um, it goes on with a conversation and ends with, I thought, a pretty amazing punchline, which, which when he has sort of identified himself as being Prejudice not only against Arabs, but he's not crazy about Oprah Winfrey or Julia Roberts or all kinds of other people for all kinds of other reasons. Um, when she gets out of the car, he stops her and says, but I wanted to tell you one more thing. My wife is from Mexico. <laughs> and I mean, that, he really did tell me that. And I just thought, that's the weirdest thing ever. Like he's trying now to recommend himself for his open-mindedness after he hated everyone else in the world. Um, but I have to say I was touched. So I'll close with this one last little piece. And then I think some of you have to leave. I want to thank you for your incredibly attentive listening. You're very generous and sweet. Um, and then some people are going to stay in here maybe, and we'll have a few questions or answers, which would be very nice. Um, this is more, OK, I'm going to close with this little piece. It's more like a prose poem. I think some of you have been writing prose poems, one of my favorite genres. A sneaky way to put things together, huh? And um, I do think, as I just mentioned, that many times we're given gifts. If you get in a few very simple habits, like writing notes in a notebook, scribbling things down, um, material will be given to you uh, that you didn't expect to find. You don't go out searching for poems or stories. Things are just given to you. They come to you, and you're in the habit of scribbling them down. So this last piece. Uh, was not one that I went out looking for. It just found me, and, uh, and I, I took notes very quickly afterwards. Um, thank you all for having me. Thanks to American Book Review and Wisache and all the kind people here who sponsored this. Gate A4. Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal, after learning my flight had been delayed four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, 
One pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing. Help, said the flight agent. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. <laughs> I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, no, we're fine. You'll get there, just late. Who is picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son. I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons just for the fun of it. <laughs> then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they had 10 shared friends. <laughs> then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? <laughs> this all took up two hours. <laughs> She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She'd pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar, crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. <laughs> there is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out free apple juice, and two little girls ran around serving it, and they were covered with powdered sugar, too. <laughs> and I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves. Such an old country traveling tradition. Always carry a plant. <laughs> Always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all those other women, too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. So, I'm very kind. Biblical literacy is fairly low. The Bible is mostly a fund of stories, sayings, images, maybe half remembered sermons. And I'm wondering, my question is, what is the place of the Quran hmm. in a Muslim community? Wow. Well, wow, that's an interesting question. Well, the Quran is very important in the Muslim community, but just as it would be difficult, I was a religious studies major at Trinity when I went there, uh, just as it would be very difficult to take, you know, passages out of context from the Bible and say, well, this represents all of Christianity, because as we know, there's a lot of violence in the Bible. Um, say, this is what you know, God tells us to do. This is, this is what Christianity stands for. We know that that would probably not represent the whole of Christianity. So in a similar way, uh, while the Quran is a sacred book, a holy book, so loved, um, and has many beautiful things in it as well. You know, I like to bring that up to anyone who's saying something ugly. I'll say, but have you ever read the chapter of the bees? I mean, think about all the beauty that's in the Quran, too. And then think about um, a, lot of, a lot of things we could bring up from the Bible. Um, and then, you know, just remember everything needs to be put in, into context. And um, most Muslim people I have known personally in my life, you know, I'm not a scholar of Islam, but would say that they abhor war and violence and that it should not, cannot ever be done in the name of Islam. So then how do you explain what's happening in Syria? I don't know extremism, fanaticism, power, and greed. 
Um, the biographer of the Assad family, uh, Dr. David Lesh, lives in San Antonio, and he can't explain it. You know, greed, power, what takes over people. Um, what's going on in Egypt right now? I've been in Egypt so many times in my life, and I'm here to say Egypt has a really liberal, beautiful heart, and I know there are a lot of Egyptians very unhappy about sort of what's supposedly representing their country at the moment and saying, wait a minute, are people going to think we're all this way now? Um, so, like anything, you have to think about context and remind people that you can no longer pull a phrase out of some strident preacher's message in the Middle East as you could someone in San Antonio. And there are plenty from San Antonio you could use that would be really scary on an international basis, and are. So, um, you know, just reminding people that there is this vast majority of citizens worldwide who do not encourage violence, who see the tragedies of violence, um, and who don't, do not, in fact, encourage um, themselves as being the proponents of the only truth. I think that's something that's really, really misunderstood about Islam. Um, I was with a lot of Muslim people growing up, and there's not one of them who ever tried to convert me, uh, versus the German Lutherans on my mother's side. <laughs> so, um, in my own household, you know, holding my own was never against the Muslims. It was only the German Lutherans. And so, just to put everything in context, um, and and. Think about all the people who fill in that big center group of human beings um, who would rather know one another than fight with one another. And you know, I, one thing I really don't understand is why this kind of tribal extremism is popular. You know, whether you're talking about Islamophobes or any kind of phobes, you know, why do we want to scare other people? Why do we want to say all those people over there are bad? Uh, is it to make ourselves feel more right? Or, I mean, it certainly doesn't seem like it would help you, the proponent of this kind of extreme belief, sleep better yourself. So I don't really understand where it's coming from in the world. You know, you would think we're in a more global time where because of all we have access to and the fact that you can read, you know, reasonable, for example, Palestinian and Israeli teenagers communicating with one another, it's really easy to find their blogs. And it's really easy to be heartened by things they say if you've heard of yet another settlement that's going to cause more problems with Israel and Palestine politically. Go see what the teenagers are saying about it, and you'll be surprised how on the same page they are and how much they all want to live in a world they share. And so I have found myself reading blogs by young people for years because often it's you know my generation that gets more entrenched in some some sort of, I'm better than you, thinking. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but... <sighs> yes? I think what you just said pretty much sums it up. It's those that are speaking out negatively are probably afraid of losing that hold that they perhaps think they have because of the right. global and everybody sort of on the same page as you yeah. mentioned, it's the fear of losing the power. Losing a position of righteousness too, you know, where you're the person who feels right. You know, obviously my group is right. And uh, you know, my mother's parents uh, were not only incredibly unhappy about her marrying someone who hadn't been raised as a German Lutheran, but who hadn't even been raised as a Christian. And yet my father knew more about Christianity than most other kids' fathers I ever met because he'd grown up in Jerusalem. And he used to march with you know, pilgrims to Bethlehem and talk to Christians the whole time he was growing up. So he knew more about the Bible, more about traditional, you know, different... He was fascinated by Christianity. Um, he worked on a Bible translation project as a young man. And um, so, you know, anybody who would try to pigeonhole him, and my grandparents finally did accept him because he was just a great person, but that was so hard for them to accept someone who wasn't of their exact... I mean, they wouldn't have been happy if she'd married a Presbyterian. So, um, just that, you know, yes. that position of rightness um, is interesting in our world because you would think that more people would have bigger hearts just because we have access to more. 
you know. And we live in communities where more people are represented sometimes now than, than sometimes. Yes. Well, as a, as a Lebanese Arab Muslim, it's just perhaps <laughs> hey. oftentimes it's because people don't know. Yes, they because don't they know. They to know. Yes, it's that's right. It's easier for them to have a hearsay. That's right. Rather than get to know the person. Beautiful, yeah. We have a, we have a mosque here in town. Oftentimes, uh, people don't enter it. And I get people to ask me, can I go to the mosque? I've said, absolutely. It's open 24-7. You can, anybody can go in there with no questions asked, whether to pray, to observe, to ask questions, uh, learn. But most people don't know just because they don't ask. And just mm -hmm. like, you know, sometimes we find ourselves we don't like Mexicans because we don't know any better. But when we immerse ourselves, or at least understand, and ask questions, education is, what I always say is communication is the key to success. Whether in personal life or it is um, in professional life, right. just seek, ask questions, and, and back to Mark's question, if I may, I think most people under, misunderstand that the Muslims are committed to holy war. We are not, <coughs> because of the word jihad. And that's what really is mistranslated, is the word jihad is basically the daily struggle. We struggle every day. You and I struggle every day, whether it be it to raise our kids, whether it be it to keep our kids from, from doing drugs, Whatever the case might be, it is a daily struggle. Doesn't necessarily, it's a holy war. It's just the jihad is a struggle, it's a daily struggle. We all struggle every single day, raising our families, keeping our jobs, keeping a roof on, uh, a roof on top of our heads, etc. Like a discipline, a discipline, a practice. Right. And in so many faiths, you would talk about having a daily jihad. Nice to meet you. And you know, you brought up my, what my father would have said, and he was often faced with people who wanted to um, convert him or tell him something extreme about, say, all Middle Easterners. He would, he would answer so simply, he would always say, my friend, I think you need a little more information. <laughs> and you know, that would sort of disarm people because they'd go, hmm, because they also put it back in their court. You know, you're the person who needs to find out more. If you knew us or what you're talking about, then maybe you wouldn't feel that way. And, and I think that many times as human beings, we still, communication's right at the heart of everything. We still just need a little more information about one another so we can connect better. Yeah.